Welcome everybody to another exciting uh, episode of Logic Live. My name is Andy. I'll be your, your host for today uh, as I'm <laughs> the host every day. Um, today we are gonna have a fantastic session. We're gonna be covering CG compositing in Flame plus color management with our good friend, John Ashby. Uh, before we get rolling with the, the slideshow here, there is a poll that we've put up on, uh, on the meeting today. So if you go to the bottom of your uh, the Zoom interface there, you'll see a button that says polling. And uh, we just kind of want to gauge everybody's um, exposure or, or you know, comfort level with uh, color management to kind of gauge how we go today. So please uh, fire that up and, uh, and uh, enter your, your answer into the poll. Oh, good. Thank you, Quinn. Appreciate it. All right. We know that color management is a wide ranging topic and uh, we're going to uh, try to tailor it to the audience level for today. Well, let's get underway. Uh, Logic Live is proudly sponsored by our friends at Synesis Oceana. Synesis has been my, uh, my reseller for about 15 years. Uh, I love these guys in addition to taking care of us at Lively. They've always been great supporters of the Logic community. They host the uh, user groups, the Flame user groups in New York and Chicago, Toronto, Atlanta, Dallas. And uh, they've always supported our One Frame of White contest. They always sponsor prizes for, uh, for the, the parties that we've had. So huge thanks to Synesis Oceana. Synesis provides solutions to keep teams connected and working. Find out more about the remote workflow solutions at synesis.io. Synesis Oceana, supporting flame artists since 1997. All right, I'm sure you all saw on Facebook, uh, we had a fantastic first Logic Fest, Logic Fest 2020. And uh, we had 13 entries and, and uh, thank you everyone who contributed. Thank you everybody who voted. Uh, there were five, five entries that uh, got the most votes and you can see them all uh, on Logic. You can see them on logic.tv. And of course the uh, five, uh, five winners there each received a one-year license of Mocha and Sapphire, courtesy of our good friends at Boris FX. Uh, I hope you all had a chance to check out their uh, live streams, their uh, virtual NAB this week. Uh, they had they showed off new versions of, uh, of of Mocha, and then of course uh, Silhouette Paint, which was fantastic. So definitely head over to BorisFX.com, check out their offerings if you haven't yet, and I want to thank them for their continued support. And uh, this Tuesday, April 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time is the Autodesk Up Close and Personal with Flame webinar. Um, we already have a ton of people signed up. It's going to be fantastic. Please, if you haven't already registered, uh, go to logic.tv and click on the events page and sign up. Um, Will Harris and the rest of the Flame, uh, the Flame development team are going to show off what's new in Flame 2021. And uh, the five winners from Logic Fest are all going to be presented. Some are going to present live. Others are going to show video presentations, but it's going to be a fantastic webinar, lots to learn, lots to see and enjoy. So definitely sign up and tune in on Tuesday, April 28th at 1 p.m. All right, let's get started with the main event. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and bring up everybody's uh, friend, John Ashby. If you don't know John, you should. He's always been a great contributor on Logic. He's an absolute visual effects wizard. He's the master of everything. He's also uh, a good friend and has always been very generous with, uh, with his time and with his knowledge when I've needed help with stuff. So I wanna welcome John Ashby to Logic Live. How's it going, John? Hi, everyone. That was a bit of an intro. Um, <laughs> so should I call out the poll? Look at this. Thank you for filling out the poll. It gives us a good idea, I guess, of what um, spectrum ha, we're dealing with. Hey, what gamut um, you're dealing with. <laughs> And um, yeah, so there were some brave people on there who said what's color management, and that's awesome. Um, I think we get the idea where the majority lies here, and that's pretty cool. Um, I guess this is really a trick question because I'm not gonna change the um, uh, presentation regarding results, but it is pretty good to see this because at the same time, I think there's gonna be something for everyone in here. So um, without further ado, should we get started? Do I? Let's get that. So, color management and CG compositing in Flame. And I guess how they're related. So, there's a disclaimer beforehand. Um, 
I think it's important just to let everyone know that um, this is my own opinion. It's based on my own experience, my own way of working. Um, it's definitely not the absolute way to work. You can always find a better way and technology will always improve. And, um, uh, you know, you reserve, we all reserve the right to change our opinion in the future as new technologies and workflows become available. As always, perform your own independent research. This is the first safe harbor statement we've ever had on a Logic Live. Well, I'm very excited. Well, I feel like a lot of this stuff, especially when we deal with things like color, is so much of it is subjective and like, what is a good image? What is a pretty image? And you're going to do all this work and it's great. And the client's going to say, it needs more yellow. And you're like, there's no yellow in this. Why should it, you know, so <laughs> it's just the way it goes. We've you know, all been at the end there. Of the day, yeah, the client is the one who makes it in the end. And you're like, well, it's not as good as version nine, but yeah. So first and foremost, um, I guess we've all heard this or thought this, why do we need to work like this? It's so much more complicated and everything worked fine before. Uh, and that is uh, anonymous frame artist <laughs> who gave me this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we could do another sure poll to see how many people <laughs> can relate to this statement. Um, they were remain nameless. Um, yes, it did. It did work before, uh, kind of. Um, and lots of films did get made before. And um, we also used to work at 1K or even SD resolutions. And now the world is different. Technology evolves, like I said. And the thing is, it's like I just bought an HDR television from the $2,000. This television is ridiculous. Um, thanks to the Flame community for suggesting the LG OLED. But I really wish we'd gotten time, a kickback from LG. Everybody on Logic <laughs> recommended that. So even I bought one. <laughs> well, I know. And that's the thing is that we're all, even like um, my brother-in-law in, in uh, Florida, they have a 75-inch HDR television. It's like you can buy this stuff at Best Buy. We uh, The pace of technology now is, is beyond what we're kind of used to keeping up with. So again, I want to learn about CG compositing. What has this got to do with color management? And the two are implicitly linked. And I guess the analogy that I'm going to use is that vegetables are your color management before CG composite, <laughs> also known as cake. So <laughs> you'll you eat your greens and you can appreciate the cake more, or you can look at it as that uh, you're not going to get your cake until you eat your greens. So whichever way of those you prefer to. Uh, that doesn't apply Either to way. people who have been locked in their house for 58 <laughs> days, by the way. <laughs> That's but not the quarantine up. diet we're as far as I'm vegetables right now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about color. Um, we've all seen this. This is a chromatic uh, diagram and uh, it's a 2D version of a 3D version because we realize that color is actually a 3D representation and we've seen things like vector scopes and RGB uh, waveforms of, as way, RGB parades as ways of representing color on the screen and then you know, you've got more abstract concepts of color of the idea of um, complementary colors and um, primary tertiary analogous you know, it's, we, we're getting the hang of all this and then all of a sudden HDR comes along and then there's more kinds of HDR and then there's HDR and Dolby Vision and you think like, okay, well, I've got to get the hang of this. So I'm going to go to Autodesk's help page and I'm going to see and we've got, okay, what is a color space? And it's like color space allows people in software to communicate colors and ambiguously using a numeric representation, which isn't helpful. So you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to open flame and just go for it. And you're at the color management page and you're like, oh my God, what's going on? And then you open up the color management node and you're like, oh no, this is crazy. <laughs> so you're like, clearly I need to do some more research here. You go online and you find out what all these cameras do and you realize all these cameras create colors that are all, they all have a completely different way of representing what they're recording. And you realize then you start looking for this thing, it's like impossible colors that you never thought were things. So then you get there and someone says, well, you know, you should look at ACES. ACES is a great way of explaining this. So you sort of do some more research like this and then someone at your office says, hey, can you explain this to me? And it's basically <laughs> sure that it, this is you <laughs> at a certain point. So it's like, you, it, it just becomes a bit too much, I think yeah. is what I'm getting to. And, um, and we did this to ourselves. That's always the thing that-, that Yeah, you realize that you know. color is actually quite complicated. That's the, the reality of it. And it's complicated to understand. It's complicated to explain and as, the good news is that as VFX artists, we do not need to know or totally understand everything about it. I understand probably about 10% about it, but I understand the important 10% that matters to us. 
So, um, yeah, let's get on to that. So, okay. color gamuts and why they matter. Modern, basically, color, modern cameras are capturing far more data than can fit in the REC 709 color gamut. So this is taken from the ACES page, which in turn is taken from the color science bubble. But as you can see here, you've got REC 709 at the bottom, and that's all of the colors of the visible spectrum. And so I dropped my whack on pen. Um, then you have P3, which is more REC 2020, 99%. We're getting up there. Um, and uh, the Sony and the Alexa. And then we have ACES, which is a color space designed to cover everything as well. So terms like gamma, gamma, 1D LUTs, 3D LUTs. The old way of getting to scene linear was to degamma the image, which is also known as a 1D LUT, log to lin or SGB, sRGB, REC 709 to linear conversion, uh, where you just take it off the gamma. This is fine as long as you're coming from REC 709 and staying in REC 709. Uh, the newer cameras are coming with color data that's greater than REC 709 can cover. So we need a way of getting that color data into a smaller container um, and a way that keeps those colors. Um, so examples like 3D LUTs where you have like log C to ACES CG. And I'll cover this a bit better in the, when we switch to plane, but just for now. What about these different color spaces? Hey, John, so sorry, just, really just, just one quick thing. It's, uh, I think it's just important to point out to everybody that, that it, uh, working in scene linear is the kind of holy grail of compositing. And uh, the, 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 especially when compositing CG, uh, and, and the challenge has always been how to get from what was shot to scene linear. Am I correct? Yes. And yeah, and I'll show, um, well, there's a couple of slides that may show that, but I'll definitely show that in the plane. Um, okay. So, a system to deal with all these color spaces, uh, it's quite simply, you can just look at it, ABL, or always be <laughs> linear. So that's it, just be in linear space. It just takes care of everything else for you. All the transforms have been done for you. That's all you need to worry about. Um, it's simplistic, but that's the way I do it. So here, you've got a workflow of how linear can, works with ACES. You start here, can you see my mouse pointer? Yeah. Yeah, so you have your input color space, which is your camera color space. This is coming from maybe uh, Ari Log C, Red Log, Sony Log, etc. You then transform this image, this uh, data into a really wide color gamut, which is ACES, as we saw, just the one that covers everything. And then from ACES, you go to ACES CG, which is our working space, or you can go to Stream Linear Vex 709 or Ari Linear Wide Gamut. There are lots of different flavors of linear, but I'll explain why I think you should stick with ACES CG. Um, and then on the output end, you just go from ACES, you, you bounce that out to ACES, and then from ACES to uh, REC 709 or P3, REC 2020, etc. But the idea being that your transfer out of this is that everyone's dealing with, you're able to have a chain of responsibility of color. So you're working in scene linear and you're seeing the result on your screen that you know kind of what it's going to look like. So uh, if it then gets put into all these other color spaces, these are just simple trim passes that the colorist is doing to get to these different mm -hmm. outputs. So how does this relate to CG compositing, which I think was your question. So first and foremost, light is additive, okay? Uh, physically based renderers, Arnold, V-Ray, Mantra, Render Man, they all look to replicate real light. So in CG terms, that means you take your lighting, you add to your reflection, you add to the refraction, you add to the specular, and you get your final image. Simple, right? Huh. So, of course, there was an asterisk there. There's always exceptions. So, uh, tracking seems to work better in video space still on plane. Um, it will change eventually, but there are always things that matter. Text module as well. I don't know where that's in tacking, but it wasn't, um, I guess, a maximum tab. <laughs> random tab. Anyway, the text module, uh, if you switch into, if you're in uh, color space, when you're going to edit it, it will go dark. It's because it's it has the older interface on there. We all know how to deal with that. Keying. Log, you can sometimes get better fine hair detail in log, and I would say that in keying, all bets are off. If you're finding a better key in the Chroma channel, then just use that. No yeah, gonna, it was once explained to me, uh, I think it was uh, our last week's guest, Alan Letary, explained to me that some of these tools are designed to work in the, um, in, almost like in, in, uh, in, in the same space that you see them in, you know? So right. uh, like your, your motion vector uh, tracking or the motion vector uh, won't work necessarily in, in scene linear if you flip it over to Rec 709 to, to video to what you would normally see, 
that's how the algorithm is um, is engineered and that's why you get better yeah. results for some of these tools exactly and the thing is it's like um the great part about uh this is you can just have a separate chain that goes off putting it into rec 709 do your tracking there and then just blow away that and keep tracking and dip back in your other action or whatever so it's mm -hmm. not um it's no big deal you get used to it um but it's really scaling. great that you're doing this this is a fantastic slide because uh, I know there are some people, uh, myself included, when I first started working in Scene Linear and the tracking didn't work, I was just like, well, the hell with this, I'm going to go back. And the, the well, answer is, it, there's, that's why I think this yeah, is a great slide. Yeah, there's no rules. Just do what you need. But the thing is, it's like in Scene Linear, you can deal with some really crazy values. So um, there's never going to be necessarily a, a, an algorithm that works for everything. So mm -hmm. sometimes you just got to know where gremlins are going to be lurking. So uh, yeah, scaling, sorry, uh, image scaling can be cleaner in log. Um, if you do, uh, if we have time, we'll do a test, but you can do it yourself. Just uh, take my word for it. What about viewing spaces? So a viewing space is just a chain of transforms that convert from the working space. That means you can work in linear and then your monitor is representing the final image or as a variety of the final image. But the, the great thing is that you can work in scene linear, your computer's in scene linear, but you're looking at it as if it's Rec 709 or whatever, and you're, you're carrying on as if you were working before, you don't really notice the difference. Um, so an example of that would be going from ASUS CG to ASUS to HCU Rec 709, or in a film pipeline, it could be something like this, where you're going from ASUS CG to ASUS, ASUS back to log C, log C where you're applying the shot LUT, and then the, after that, the show LUT. And mm -hmm. yeah, it sounds, hectic at that point, but um, if you think about this part, this is the bit that's happened. The reverse of this is what happened on set, mm -hmm. and we're here. So uh, they've done their a CDL is a sort of a more non-destructive transform. I, I would look at it like a sort of color correction where they're balancing things. They, they're quite useful CDLs because they're easy to pass around uh, versus a LUT, which can contain a lot of crazy information, where CDLs can be uh, very lightweight. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the show lab can be anything. It can be a, a variation of log to rec 709, or it can be a sort of film effect lab or whatever, but it's generally what they were looking at uh, on set. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a lot of LUTs. <laughs> uh, we're still rendering legacy C linear. Do we really need to consider using ASICs? So um, I guess short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, it depends. Um, <laughs> there are certain edge cases and it's important to know when and how to fix them. And uh, that's kind of all you need to know, I think. So yeah. Color management's Enough like the English rules. language, you know? <laughs> there are a million exceptions to the rules, right? Well, yeah, I remember some example saying that like uh, of all the English language, like there's only like 1200 words are being used and the New York Times was over a um, spectrum of a month or something like that. So. Stop it with the color space analogies. Um, <laughs> That'll be our next contest. We'll be the yeah, best exactly. color space analogy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to stop the share a second and uh, get into playing. Uh, meanwhile, are there are lots of things in the chat. I haven't been following those. Uh, everyone says you look fantastic. You have oh, wonderful nice. depth of field. Uh, there was just one about shrinking. Uh, actually, just see, Alex, did that help? I think that helped. Um, bring the chat window up. It's gone. All right, cool. Thank you. That was okay. the voice of Alex Arce. Uh, he'll be credited for this uh, at the end. The if you'd like to book him for voiceover work, he is available. Uh, his agent's information will be in the chat. Sorry, go back to you, John. Anyway, yeah, so uh, on with the cake. Um, linear curve, li sorry, linear uh, gradient. We've all seen this, hilarious. Um, so <laughs> We've never uh, seen it through Zoom's compression though. It's, <laughs> it's like two bit color. Um, yeah, so if you're, if you're taking your linear image that comes in and you're just converting it, and for the sake of, I'm just turning off the, the viewing line, so there's no other things happening. So if you're working in video, um, like using the legacy to video method that was what was in our claim. Um, if you do things on the master grade after that, you can see what's happening is that it's really up, like we're, I'm doing a, a game, which is a straight multiply, and you can see everything flying off at the top, but you can see 
it's going to be really hard to control this part of the image. Versus if I'm in linear, and, I, and I've got these two mimic links. But you can, you can see the controls are a lot more manageable here. So if I just want to brighten the image slightly, it's a lot easier to control stuff. Whereas if in video, you know, that same, those same values give a completely different image. You know, we're going to just make it obvious 1.4, 1.2. Okay, in video, if, I, if I'm in video, that's what I get. If I'm in linear, that's what I get. So mm -hmm. is, and the curves comparing the two, one of them is all over the place and one of them is a lot more under control. So that's the basics of it. Again, not particularly practical example, but here is one. I promise you a practical example, here you go. So what have we got here? This is, again, bypassed, so there's no uh, funny business. Um, this is a high dynamic range image. It was taken with my DSLR. It's just one of the faces for a um, uh, spherical image. You can see some numbers here are nuts. We've got up here, so there's 50 somewhere up here. There's uh, 10, 10, 5. You know. So all these, and if we were in old Rec 709, we'd be looking at essentially everything gets clamped above here. On the way out, so we we can and we can we we know it's going to get clamped at the end, not put a clamp in there just to, to make the point. So there we go, everything's there clamped, and you know this is now everything's there ones, but we've lost all that detail. And of course, you can come in here with a grade, and you can try and get all this back. You can say, okay, well you know we'd never send that out like that. The reality is we bring this all the way down and you can see how far we've got to get this down to be able to see these buildings and you see how saturated these buildings are coming down and you're like well we're going to compensate from that we've got gammering up but we're now getting this washed out tone mapped image kind of thing and so now i'm going to come back to the lift and i'm going to bring that in or the, you know and all of a sudden you're fighting so hard to keep some sort of image happening here and like yeah we've kind of got there though it just looks at a certain point, you know, the shadows now are getting crushed. So if we do an ACES transform where we're going from linear X709 to ACES, like I showed in that diagram, and then ACES to HD video on the way out. So here, for example, it's taken care for me. I can have all these values just in that single transform. All these values are back in spec, and we've got a beautiful sort of image here. And it's all there. We've come from, and I've done nothing if I take this out to prove a point. And I'm always a fan. If there's a short, answer, short way to the final, take it, you know? Oh, sure. So um, does that make sense? Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I'm sure that every single artist uh, on here has uh, has gone down the path of trying to like brute force, you know, color correct something to get it look right, to get it to look right in this weird like color environment that I've have to deal with. Like a client's giving me a piece of a piece of artwork to use as a logo or a, a sign that I have to put on a you know on the on the bus uh, the, uh, or whatever that thing they call them now. The Link NYC. If we had to replace that screen, you were given you know like a PNG or a JPEG or something. We've all gone down the path of trying to brute force color correct that to make it look right in this color space as opposed to converting it into the proper color space. And uh, it makes yeah, perfect and sense. I think the great thing is here, you've got, again, a chain of responsibility because this, you knew you matched to this, like this was our, color, this, this was our viewing transform, which I'll show you in a second, which is how I have my viewing transform set up. Um, I'm looking up, uh, well, not this one specifically, but I'll show you what I do have, and that is, that um, I can do all my color correction inside of here, you know, look, while looking at my viewing line, and then that, so I just turn it on, mm -hmm. which is exactly what it's doing. Um, I'll come to my color management, and I'll just do, uh, which I think I actually set up here. Yeah, so here I'm just going from scene linear X709 to ACES, ACES to ACES CG, so I've got my image here, and then I'm coming at the master grade, and I know I'm just gonna maybe add some, contrast and a bit of saturation for the hell of it. And 
I know that I'm still giving these ridiculous values. I haven't lost anything, but I know that whoever does this on the other end can, uh, and in this instance, it's going to be ASUS CD to ASUS, ASUS to HD video. John, there's a question from the Let's chat. Um, are you are you working in a legacy project? Right now, okay, so the idea of a legacy project, C-linear project, I think it's a little bit confusing. Um, it doesn't matter what you're working in, the, the, and I'll show at the end if there's time how I have my project set up. Um, just because it's legacy or linear um, in here, color management, uh, this is how I have my project set up. I have none of the stuff, it's very simple. I have something for log and um, just because I want to see log like a log image. Um, and this is a, a thing about viewing rules is that actually viewing rules can kind of catch you out. Um, all a legacy project will have is this set to uh, unknown. I think action set to unknown. This is all the same. And uh, it will give you a long list of stuff here. So I generally delete all that and just uh, keep my default, which is my uh, ACE to CG to uh, ASUS, ASUS to HD video. And um, uh, and then I'll have, yeah, I'll keep some of the normals just because we're used to seeing normals like that kind of pale blue thing mm -hmm. for the map and um, something for video. And uh, yeah, that's it. Cool. Um, Thanks. So the, in here, for example, um, with the, uh, I guess with the concept of a legacy project, you know, everything's getting tagged as unknown and stuff. So uh, you can get, I think it's better. Um, I like to know, I like to control what I'm seeing. I like to know that I should be seeing what I'm seeing and if something looks wrong, then I want to be able to catch it. So I guess a good instance of that is here. If, I, if you have um, uh, color management and you convert something to log here, and just do it, just for the sake of it, I'm going to do it just simply uh, log to lin, or lin to log classic. I want it to look like log. You know, I want to see it. And I said, I see that and my viewing light showing it and I've got here and I've tagged it as log. Classic, where is it? Interlog, at least I can't remember. Whatever, we're just going to call it Ari for the hell of it because you know it's log. Um, I, I want it to look like log because I don't want to accidentally have this being represented as a Rec 709 image on my display and be working in log. I don't want that cat caught out like that. I want to see that and go, oh, something's wrong. Does that make sense? Totally. Uh, yeah, so gremlins to be aware of. They're always gremlins. So let's take a very colorful image. This is, um, again, I'm going to turn the viewing light off just to make sure you're seeing what uh, the screen is so, or what the data is. So here I've got some very saturated colors. And you could imagine this is like police lights or something. And then uh, we're going up to one here up to one here, up to yeah, one in blue here, and the red is fully saturated. So just kind of create a pseudo um, log C image. So we're pretending it's from a, a log, a camera, uh, a, an ARRI log C image camera here. So we've got all this is now much flatter. Um, and if I go from that, using what we just talked about in ASIS, of going log C to ASIS, ASIS to ASIS CG, you can see some crazy stuff happening. So for example, here we're going over one, and here we're going under on the green uh, negatives. We've got negatives on the green and the red here, and we've got, um, well, red seems to have survived. But what you'll see in, if this was a real image, this would manifest itself in kind of like uh, weird haloing around things like uh, exit signs or, um, uh, yeah, police lights, and they become a tech fix, essentially, that comes back to the effects to fix. So we just have to know how to deal with that and, be, and know that we are not going to have multiple flavors of linear to work in, because I know you can work in ARRI log C, or you work in, sorry, um, wide gamut ARRI, but it's not really practical to have all your textures uh, all set up for log, a log C pipeline, or sorry, a wide gamut pipeline all set up for it. Um, an ACC pipeline all set up for a C linear Rec 79. You just want to have everything in one unified color space mm -hmm. and then know that when you have these problems, you know how to deal with them. So what's interesting is if you go from uh, log C into uh, C linear ARRI, 
um, we, we don't have these negative values appearing. Mm -hmm. It's able to contain them. So what's a good approach is to, when you get one of those shots, just ask for the log C plate um, or the red, red log uh, plate and just paint through the, the bit so do the transform in one and the transform in the other, the ACCG, and then just paint through the bit in the camera color space. And that's how we deal with it. Good tip. So why custom? Uh, yeah, so uh, you may have noticed that I always seem to use color transform custom. So again, gremlins, because if you use things like the view transform, they're like instant classification. They do take care of the tagging for you. You can go from log C to into video, but if you look at the transform, some of them do some stuff that I'm not doing, like it's going to X, Y, Z here. And so again, chain of account accountability, you know that you want to be able to hand off an image or work with a, a set of LUTs that everybody else is using from Nuke to uh, Resolve to um, Maya, Maya. So um, if everybody's using the same uh, LUT chains, then things are just going to work. So in this instance, I prefer to go from uh, in this instance, yes, yeah, log C to ASIS, ASIS to HD video, just because I know what it's doing and then at the end I'm tagging it. Um, again, it's, there's a slight price to pay of uh, convenience, but the control is that your image doesn't get screwed. Yeah, I think it's a really good point to make is that uh, while there are other ways to do that conversion in, in Flame, if you go the ASIS route, it's going to look the same for anybody else in any other application in any other department that is also working in the ASIS world. So if, you're, if, all, if your stuff is going back and forth to Nuke or back and forth to Resolve, uh, you're kind of, or like you said, Maya, you're guaranteed that they're going to see the same thing on their side, um, which is uh, vital. It's the last position yeah. you want to be in is to be that guy in the chain who screwed up the color. Yeah, it, that's it. You know, it, it's, it's embarrassing and um, it's something you do, it will, will do, but no facility wants to be the one who has to explain to the production mm -hmm. that they've got to re-render all the shots of the colors from. <laughs> Correct, so, and that's and it's something that gets caught very late because all of a sudden everyone just expects them to work with the LUTs. So, and especially on a big show where they're going to color correct hundreds and hundreds of shots, mm -hmm. they don't want to drop yours in and drop somebody else's in, and then they just work out. Oh, hang on a second, we have got this LUTs that's working for these shots, and these ones aren't working anymore. And then they've got to find out this because uh, some Muppets decided to work in a clamped Rec 709 space, and um, totally that's. But that's also, I think so, it's a great, it's a great answer to the question, why ACEs? Well, because it's universal. It's, again, every, Yeah, I think it's, it's accountability. I think it's color mm -hmm. accountability. That's what I like about it. And um, again, I can show the example here as well, is that um, here I'm going, I have a uh, TG aircraft that we bring. Is this cake? Are we, are we, are we entering, are we're we starting cake, our dessert we're... phase right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was like a taster of the cake. And now we can get like, a little bit more cake, and then we'll get to the final bit of cake, cake overdose. <laughs> and then, um, so, yeah. The so chat room is ready. Here. They're saying forks <laughs> at the ready. <laughs> These people have been trapped in their houses for 58 days. I know, if we look, is anyone like asleep yet? Like, <laughs> I hope we're keeping, it's difficult, you know, you gotta, you gotta keep people aware. No, it's, uh, you, you're setting the table, man. What's great is so, Doug, uh, I, I just realized Doug Walker is, is here, and I'm curious to see what he voted for in the poll. Oh, um, no pressure. Yes. Well, hopefully he missed the first bit. I'm no, sure he said uh, uh, he, he, he's agreeing with things. Yoda, he is, yes, he agrees that Doug Walker <laughs> is his personal Yoda. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I think with all this, the thing is, the point, if there is one takeaway from this, is it is super complicated and nobody mm -hmm. expects you to know everything about it. But I think well, all you need to know is how to get yourself into trouble and how to get yourself out of trouble. Bingo. And know where trouble is going to lurk because... Um, you know, we are working with some crazy values sometimes in CG. And like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just because it, 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 in cameras, normal camera world, it's its own thing. But when we start converting from uh, computer linear generated images, because you can, we have infinite power, obviously, in the computer, some of these um, HDRs can be monstrous. So we, we really need to know where to problem spot this sort of stuff. Um, totally. So here I'm going from... Uh, Again, I think I'm just doing the, the example of old. So we uh, have our tagged images linear. Um, and what we want to do is here we've got our, our viewing LUT, um, uh, pseudo viewing LUT, which is basically I'm going to turn off. Okay, so I'm going from linear to Rec 709 and mm -hmm. then clamping the output. 
because this is what's going to have to happen when it gets into uh, commercials or something like that. So here, I know I want to make this color, this image work, and I'm going to look at my uh, um, look at uh, through the uh, context. That's the word I was looking for. Yeah. So now here we know what we want to do. Obviously, we can see it's a bit flat. We want to add. We want to make the um, uh, reflection really bright, but then we know we've got to add more contrast to it and you know, what, what, we end, what ends up happening is we get, just to get our values down first, because we are up, if I just do this one first, just to show you how far up we are. We're above one, mm -hmm. above one, so we still want to come down. And yeah, now we can get this to somewhere and but we still now lose contrast and you know, and then this starts happening and it starts looking dirty around here because we've got too much contrast. And you're really fighting against keeping something in one to zero. And also what we don't want to happen is we do a bunch of color correction that we know, and then it just gets clamped in the color suite and we're like, well, what did you do in my image? Mm -hmm. That's not what I made and we've all been there. So what I really like about um, ASIS is that, you know, we've got everything is under control. Yeah, so what you're showing here is the same exact source image, those linear EXRs from CG, but just converted yeah. to ACES and uh, from ACES to Rec. 709. Yeah, exactly. So if I just come in here now, and, I, and what's interesting is you can show, I'm just going to, oops. Hello. This is a lesson, lesson. Yeah, you do want to make sure that when you're, um, you want to be careful to put the, um, uh, the mat in because you don't want, this to happen yeah. when you're color correcting, that's gonna cause trouble because it's a pre-multiplied image. So just make sure you do that. Woo, lesson kids. All right, so <laughs> here we've got, the great thing is here, we can come in here to our, um, I've got my viewing light on here, which is here, it's the same thing. I'm doing mm -hmm. now. Um, and I can really push this all the way up. And I'm still, I come in and bypass that. We're still below one, and we yeah. crank this up. Two, I mean, we're up to 0 0.9. So again, caveats, sometimes you want to blow things out, but it makes it a lot harder to do it in HDR, but you're also going to burn people's eyes out, so be careful about that. <laughs> um, all right, more fun, Kate. Let's talk about um, uh, what that meant earlier of the lighting. So here, i am put my LUT on, what I've done is I've brought in my image, I've converted it into ASIS, I've took my, my beauty pass, that's the basic render that we've got, and then here's just an individual pass, um, the reflection, and yet yeah, you can see the uh, HDR we used for the reflection there, mm -hmm. the whole runway. Um, we have uh, the specular, uh, or refraction and the uh, specular. So refraction is just going to be those little uh, bits of glass that you have in there. So um, yeah, if you take your lighting, you add on your reflection, you add on your um, refraction and uh, reflection, no, what did I say? Uh, specular, sorry, you're going to have your final image. Mm -hmm. um, so what's great about that is that if we want to do um, if we want to do uh, what we talked about earlier, where we're saying, okay, so we really want this reflection to stand out. We really want to see this, uh, I think it's called a belt line, but um, it's very synonymous with uh, when they're doing CG cars and CG planes, they want to have this strip that goes all the way down it so you can see how that, uh, just see how great it is. Basically. So in this instance, <laughs> sleek. we can just, yeah, excellent. It's a sleek pass. Great. Yeah. So in this instance, it means all we have to do is come in here and uh, modify the uh, reflection. And what I'm able to get is a lot more of a sleeker looking image without having affected the color or, you know, so it's, this is why I think it's, it's better to work in passes. And the thing is, how this relates to scene linear versus video is 
if we do the same thing in video space, so we convert everything to video, we take our um, video passes now. That we convert, this is the, just a simple lump going from legacy to video. We take the light and we add the reflection to the, I mean, this all looks right, okay? This looks correct, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but when you add that on in video space, weird stuff starts happening. Mm -hmm. And you can see this isn't, this isn't anywhere near what we're expecting. And likewise, if I do the opposite of taking, uh, subtracting the, uh, um, taking the re reflection off the main image, weird stuff starts happening. So it's like, just being linear, this stuff works. It's meant to work in linear. There's no reason not to be. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I remember being trained that like, when, of course, when only working in video space that uh, yes, if you get a spec pass, you either add or screen that on whichever looks better or the same thing th with a reflection, you know, you end up going through all the different transfer modes or you always multiply yeah, so you, your, your shadows. Like these were all gotchas, go arounds and, and compromises as opposed to like you said in that slide at the beginning, light being an additive process. You can add and subtract these things um, yes, and they exactly. will behave and as they're supposed to. Exactly. And the thing is, it's like, we you don't want to be, um, yeah, you don't want to be that person <laughs> who, who screams <laughs> their uh, reflection pass on top of the image. So um, what does that mean in terms of, uh, so yeah, I mean, I if anyone's ever had the fortune to work on one of my comps before, they'll know this is never how neat <laughs> one of my comps looks. It normally looks like, I don't know, someone's just thrown up a bunch of nodes everywhere. <laughs> but um, you did comment on the state of it. So I've tidied it up just for you. So um, yeah, this is just uh, going through what can be done with these passes. So you've got a CG render, we've got, um, uh, we're doing the color looks strange because we we haven't tagged it as um, uh, seen linear. Uh, we haven't tagged it as anything. I don't really like to tag um, my stuff here uh, because if you're caching the media, when you tag it, it's going to recache. Mm -hmm. So um, you, I prefer to have my tag out here um, along with the color conversion that needs to happen, just because it's just it's easier just to bring everything in and. Um, and not worry about things hidden inside of things. So I find this is a, again, this is an instant gratification thing, but when you're trying to troubleshoot uh, a comp and find out why something's wrong or not working, having something inside of here or here is a classic for me because mm -hmm. it's just like, oh, really? You know, so I, it's, it's a, again, it's a, an extra step, but I think it's ultimately a lot um, more robust way of working. Uh, so yeah, first things first uh, was to fix an alpha. So this is something that's going to happen in CG. You're going to see some things creeping through sometimes. Um, the first thing I do is always a slap comp of just bringing in the uh, plate, which has gone through, uh, just putting it into ACES CG. Here's the map. Bring it up here. And um, yeah, and I can see immediately where are things that I want to fix. And I've got like a, yeah, again, a, a fake, um, sky background on there, just something to not be looking at black. Um, and yeah, you can see some funky stuff happening on the lights. I don't know if that's clear. Yep, you can see it on the windows. You're like, yeah, exactly. You're like, what's, what's going on there? Um, so a bit of homework and uh, come on, sticky whack on, sticky whack on. <laughs> but you know what? Yes. That went 46 minutes. I, I got to say that that was pretty good for the, <laughs> for the whack on. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, just a simple uh, gene mask, nothing, nothing fancy there. That fixes it. And when we come in here, now, no more funk. Great. So uh, <laughs> it's got a funkless, funkless composite. <laughs> a funkless composite. That's what you want. Again, it gremlins. There's always gremlins. And the thing is, it's like embrace the gremlins. Just know how to swap them. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, uh, again, taking my color arts, and uh, I have to say a caveat to all this is uh, when you start breaking down somebody's work into their component pieces, like uh, in this instance, we've taken our beauty parts and we're just dissecting it into the individual render elements and then combining them again. Do be a little bit respectful because obviously the lighting artist has put this together. 
So if you then just start dismantling everything they've done and just start from scratch, sometimes it can be a little bit offensive. So have a uh, um, tread with care, especially if you start breaking their shaders and they're like, why does the reflection look terrible? And you're like, because I separated it and gamed it up by 400. And they're like, mm, <laughs> just... So um, I always use the analogy of like, um, CG's job is to make it look photo real. Comp's job is to make it look like a camera shot. It. And just start with that basics and mm -hmm. then um, work out from there. And obviously some things are gonna get in the way and change all that as they always do. So, uh, First things I notice about this image that I want to fix are, first off, it feels very flat. Um, it's a very big problem with this shot because the client wanted it shot isometrically or um, they wanted it shot flat to the image. They wanted to see it to be, I don't know why it was a choice. They would respect that. But typically, that's why you always see planes from above, um, just because it's just a much more pretty way of showing the, the scale of an object. and. The problem you've got is when you do this, all of a sudden it kind of looks a little bit like a toy. So uh, we had to combat that. Um, we need to add some dimension to it. And also what we've got is another challenge of reflective objects is that, especially metal ones, is once you get to these extremes, you are hitting basically a mirror. Um, and you know, the computer, it's a, a, a um, what's the word? Uh, physically based renderer. So it's going to try and do what happens in real life and yet that's what you get. Um, but at this instance, it's just not particularly what we want because we want to control this a bit better. We want to add these highlights, but we want to uh, maybe take them away first and bring them back. Also here we can see that uh, the paneling here versus the paneling here, this is really sharp and crisp. This is, we're losing this a little bit here. Um, also, um, the it's just it, it's just feeling a little flat so we'll try and fix all this stuff um with as little work as possible which i always think is the best way <laughs> so uh where to start so let's start with um the nose we have an ambient occlusion pass um and i'll go through these passes but essentially this is to bear in mind this is version 56 i think of the renders so what we started off thinking we were going to do is uh, something different to how we eventually put it all together. Um, we realized some passes we didn't need or some passes we like, no, don't give us that, give us this one, but we didn't name it differently. So it's, yeah, this thing happens in production, but we've got obviously our, you know, some of the our, our, our passes that we all know. So this is, uh, again, to focus them out, you can ignore these. Some of these are uh, V-Ray specific passes that we didn't use, but they just got left in there. Um, Denoiser, uh, we actually preferred the, uh, the image with the uh, grain in than the denoise image. We felt there was a little bit more detail in there, so we didn't use it. Um, uh, we have a diffuse filter. So these are, again, these are V-Ray raw passes. If you really want to know uh, about V-Ray raw, you can look into it and they'll explain. The map is slightly different. It's using multiplication, but it's all on their website. Um, and uh, you do get a more granular way of fixing shots, but um, eh, nine times out of 10, we just do the atmosphere work. Um, next, uh, again, these are raw. So these are our, our multi mats, our famous, uh, we know what these are. <laughs> um, uh, glow illumination, we didn't use it in the end. Uh, we started with it, didn't add anything useful, got rid of it. Where it goes. So in production, you're often going to end up with a render and you're like, well, what's all this stuff that we don't need? And it's like, well, that's why, because it just happens. So um, normals, again, I don't really get into the process of relighting everything. I know you can do that just because you can, it doesn't necessarily mean you should. Um, you can throw a normals pass in action. You can do some incredible relighting, but uh, again, by everywhere, you can um, break an image and none of the lighting you'll ever do will look as good as what can be done with Arnold, so careful. Just because um, you can doesn't mean you should. Is something as a concept my clients have never really fully embraced. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, I mean it's 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 great. Like what you can do in action yeah. with the light relighting of stuff and stuff. But I think often you can do that exactly the same way with tech passes from um, CG, mm -hmm. and uh, I will show those. So uh, here again, reflection filter. This is a V ray roll pass. Ignore uh, again. Blah blah. blah Specular. Um, top down, this is a great pass. This is um, 
local y vector. So um, uh, from the top uh, and from the bottom. Fantastic classes, really good for cars, really good for CG, basically use them as a map. Um, next, UV, didn't use that. Um, world normals. Uh, this is like a normals pass, but in world coordinates. Uh, again, I don't think we use this. Um, my favorite of all the passes, the uh, fruitiest of all the passes, if I just uh, <laughs> bring this down, you can see. So what is a position pass for those that don't know? Um, what it allows you to do is, it is the, something, everything on the, on the object has a value, a color value, and that does not change throughout the life of the object. So what's great about that is that it means using this wonderful, wonderful map, uh, position map plugin from uh, Lewis Sanders. Um, it's amazing. And I'll just quickly show you what it is. So uh, Matchbox, of course. Uh, these are just, uh, oops. Interesting. So yeah, I'm um, just piping in the foreground, uh, the map, and uh, only the position pass, of course. So uh, position pass just divided by the alpha, so to make sure we've got um, an unmultiplied position pass, so we're not getting stuff in transparency. Um, what have we got? So, oh, that's why, because we Game down the viewer. So, uh, yeah, results, mat, and um, the mat is a, a mat output for you, not the mat input, um, and the position pass. So, what we can do is we can say, I want the tail. Okay, and we'll just increase the tolerance. And you see it's drawing a mat on the tail. And the thing is, that sticks to the object all the way through. So great. Oh my God. So, and the wonderful thing about it is, as you'll see here, it takes care of the occlusion for you as well, which is huge. So, yeah, if you think about what you wanted to do in with just straight up G masks and stuff, it's just, uh, it's a godsend. Yep. To be able I can't to, tell you how many times I've done that with straight up G masks. Yeah. So, in this instance, like I knew I wanted to use the AO pass as a mat to uh, add definition so I can just color correct down just the nose of the plane. So I've created my mat, um, just nothing fancy here, I'll just dividing by the alpha first. Uh, getting my mat, doing a mat edge to really make sure I'm getting that. Um, and then I use the position mat to just extract the nose. And as you can see, it's taking care of the propeller for me. Um, and then, yeah, I just multiply that. And I've got a map of the nose with about five minutes work. Again, laziness is key to all of this. <laughs> laziness is, is like the, uh, the, the uh, thinking man's efficiency. Is that what you say? So I would say that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we've done that. That's my excuse anyway. So that's, so that's one map. Sophisticated here. efficiency. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, top down passes, bring them in. We've got, uh, I'm just crunching them a little bit. Um, uh, and my multi mats, and now I'm going to use those, uh, and I'm just uh, adding the two mats together and clamping it up to make sure we've got no uh, funky stuff happening. Um, and then I'm feeding them in as mats into action on top of our four layers here. This I'll come back to. So here we've got our comp. This is pretty much the same as our slap right now. And we come in here, and I love this new way of working in action. It's fantastic. So uh, first layer, we've seen that, adding that one on, adding that one on, adding that one on. That's just our, um, what we did out in the action um, first. And here on my, uh, I'm adding a master grade to my reflection. So just adding a touch of contrast. Um, now, one of the problems I've got is, again, these are now getting really hot. Uh, it's kind of distracting seeing those two. So what I'm gonna come into is, Again, isolating the highlights of the reflection pass. We know the troubles in the reflection. Um, uh, again, just getting another map to uh, um, 
get them a bit more visible. And then I have a position map just to isolate the roof of the plane um, and those uh, and the nose and uh, those stick to it. And then I'm just going to multiply those mats by my isolated mat. So I've got the most egregious parts in a mat, and then I'm just going to, for the sake of the demo, just show you dem I don't know if you can see, I've done, overdone it here just so you can see mm -hmm. it because it's very subtle. But um, uh, essentially, I'm just, oops, not like that. Definitely not like that. Um, and then the difference is that now these are a little bit more under control. So, uh, yeah, I'm able to uh, tone, get these re reflections being a bit more uh, exciting, but those ones are not. So next up is to really shape the dimension of the plane. So uh, first thing is first is getting the uh, nose where we want it. So if I come in here, all I'm doing is uh, yeah, adding a add selective master grade. Well, it could be anything, but add camera effects. And it's, it doesn't really matter, but the point is that you're adding the, uh, I'll do it with a selective master grade. Add selective master grade. And I'm coming in here and I'm choosing in the controls my input map, which is in this instance, number five. And I'm just and I'm setting that to alpha. If I press F8, you can see I've got my map coming in. And this is a really cool way of working now, I find, compared to like, having lots of nodes all out in tree because you can switch stuff on and off a lot easier. I really like it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, so if I just come down to, that just means I add contrast in this, that one little piece. And you've got to be careful with this because uh, in V-Ray, the ambient occlusion pass is actually called a, a dirt pass, UA dirt pass, because it does. It's like the more you contrast in those pieces, the more it will begin to look dirty. And when you're doing a CG car or, um, Plane, you don't really want it to do that. And also, if you push these down too much, it's going to look like the panels are sticking up, which you don't want to show. So, uh, so that's what this guy is doing. And uh, yeah, it's a little subtle, but it works. And it's made of these, now feel like these. Next up is uh, top down passes. So, again, same process, bring it in. Uh, set to the media alpha, um, check the alpha with an F8, come in here and then I can just just gain the top of it and I'm just what I'm bringing is a highlight across the top. Everything that's facing up on the object is getting that top light brought to it and likewise on here I'm doing the opposite and just bring in the bottom and all of a sudden it's starting to feel a lot more three-dimensional and you look at the difference before and after just that. I'd say it's night and day. That's great. That top down uh, pass is fantastic, fantastic yeah. concept. And likewise, I just did something for the decal. We had to just uh, make it look a bit more like the color, of the actual color. Was, uh, and that's the great thing about having a specific map for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then. Yeah, obviously the, the great thing is that without any, without even thinking about clamping or clipping or color or any of that is I've got a really good looking object that I know if I bypass my viewer and here I'm just doing exactly what the viewer is doing, but like all these values are in check. So the colorist has the flexibility to blow stuff out accordingly if they want to ruin your image or <laughs> they can, um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, but yeah, the backhanded uh, compliments that I love the most. <laughs> but you're, you're giving them enough rope to hang themselves with, essentially. And then, you know, and likewise, if it comes back and you're like, what the hell do you do in my image? You can say, you know, this is the LUTs, like, what, what's wrong here? So, um, again, it's, I, I like it. It's a chain of accountability. Um, and I guess, uh, um, yeah, just in a final sort of thing that I did, which I really, really like, uh, it's called a sweeten. Look at that. But um, uh, one of the big problems with CG is things like this, where it's just a speck. Uh, 
like that. And the thing is, cameras don't really do that. And uh, they do, but they don't. And what you want to see in these little bits is like some sort of chromatic aberration without it being like that classic thing of when someone switched on the chromatic aberration plugin and everyone just like, ooh. So what I really like, so I've just taken here an iris of, um, I think it's from um, uh, lens, whatever that lens flare plugin is called. Um, Fresh lift? You know, no, the lens flare one, the, the one that's mm. all the Jamie Abrams. Anyway, whatever. Um, so I've just transformed it and I've done a chroma warp on it like that. And the new Convolve, thank you, Francis, for this, <laughs> is um, what I'm able to do is add a very, very, providing that as the kernel, you're getting a much more photo-like effect to those. Oh, that's great. Things that feel very CG. And uh, that's one of my favorite uh, things that we now have available in the new version of Flame. Um, and uh, here ended, I think, and I don't think there's much more I can tell you. John, that was awesome. Fantastic, man. Does uh, anybody have any questions? No, so far I'm just getting just getting accolades, man. That was fantastic. Well, yes, then that, uh, yeah, you know what? And the sweet in there was definitely the icing on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I wanted to keep it, you know, keep the analogy <laughs> of the dessert. Absolutely. Um, I guess it's like the aperitif afterwards, right? Yes, sir. The limoncello. It was, uh, it was wonderful. John, thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, you can reach out to John on Logic. Uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to help out. And really, man, that was, that was excellent. Thank you very much. No worries. And likewise, again, like, this is not necessarily the best way to work, but it's a pretty solid system. And um, I would recommend uh, embracing it. Um, and just what I really like about the... Um, custom mode on the color corrections, you really get to learn what it is that you're doing. And um, it allows you to reverse engineer what you've got from uh, editorial sometimes to say like, hey, what are these LUTs? What do they do? What order do they go in? And then you could think like, oh, well, we know we're going from linear to camera space and then from camera space to CDL and then the CDL, the, um, to the, the Rec 709 LUT, you know, so if you think backwards from that point, a lot of the time you can get the, the, um, the color correct. Totally. So just want to let everybody know about the upcoming Logic Live sessions. Next uh, Sunday is going to be the uh, Andy and Fred show. We're going to do some live Python scripting, which should be uh, a whole lot of fun. So if you've uh, been curious at all about what kind of things you can do with Python and Flame, definitely tune in next week. It's going to be fantastic. For the, uh, this is designed from the absolute beginner straight up to the overconfident intermediate, which is how I like to describe myself. Uh, the following Sunday on uh, Sunday, May 10th, we're going to do a neat video deep dive with Tim Chistikoff from Neat Video. He is one of their uh, senior developers over there, and he's going to take us through really how to get the most out of Neat Video. So many of us know it, so many of us are actually own it and use it, but maybe don't know uh, all the possibilities uh, that uh, Neat Video contains. So definitely tune in for that. Then on May 17th, we're going to do an interview with Will Harris, the Flame Family Product Manager. Uh, to discuss uh, everything that's new in the 2021 release. I think we're going to have some more of the dev team on as well, and it's going to be a fantastic opportunity for Q&A. If you had anything you ever wanted to ask these guys, if there's any tools you'd ever like to see implemented, this is definitely the forum for you. Uh, then May 24th, we're going to do Maya for Flame Artists with Yuri Tempolsky from Sao Paulo. <clears throat> uh, heading on, uh, closing out May rather, we're going to do Connected Conform for Social Deliverables with Brian Bailey. Uh, I, uh, as I said last week, I am one of those people who wishes I could social distance myself from social deliverables, but if they're going to be a part of our, uh, <laughs> of the new normal, uh, Brian has certainly come up with a few ways to make those go a lot smoother for you. Uh, June 7th, we're going to do silhouette paint with our friends at Boris FX and June 14th resolve for flame artists with David Johns from LA. That's what's coming up on logic live. You'll be able to find uh, all the logic live sessions on logic.tv as well as a bunch of other great content. Please be sure to go over to our, uh, our uh, YouTube page and subscribe. And uh, thank you again to our friends at Synesis Oceana for sponsoring Logic Live. 
Uh, find out more about their remote workflows and any other solutions you might need at Cinesis.io. And finally, it's my cat Harrison's eighth birthday today, so we just wanted to wish her a very happy birthday. She was good. She didn't try to come in and, uh, and storm the session, which is a first <laughs> for us. So I want to thank her and wish her a happy birthday. But thank you, John Ashby. Thank you, everybody on Logic. Thank you, Autodesk, for, uh, for supporting us. And we will see you all next week. Take care, everybody.